Hey everyone and welcome to another episode of Fight Chat Friday from TKD Coach Academy. This week we're talking about why your drills might not work and translate directly into spying. So if you're curious why all of your hard work doesn't pay off in the ring, stay with us for this episode. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Fight Chat Friday. So as the title suggests, today's episode is going to tackle the whole idea of sparring drills. Um, so that's the way most people do train in to improve their sparring skills. So the inspiration for this comes from when I personally myself training for sparring contests, whether it was Europeans, Worlds, whatever, we would get together in a bit of a group and we would do drills as we see a lot on Instagram and things like that, yeah. of shots that may work, things that are very common and sequences that we see. And we would just repeat them over and over again, almost coming from the the idea, Adrian, of like uh, mastering a skill with X amount of repetitions and the skill is completed. And that was kind of like, sure. if you think about it, it kind of comes from like the, the career mode on like a, a UFC game on PlayStation or something. It's like you do X amount of reps and boxes ticked, check. I know that skill is added to your arsenal, but unfortunately, that's not the way it works. Yeah, it doesn't quite translate into the, you know, the real human experience of it. And therefore, you know, I think everybody has experienced this, you know, so you, you, you've you been training away, you've been doing the drills, it's starting to come together on the pads or with your, your training partner. And then you go into the ring, you start sparring and you just get nailed every time you try to throw the shot mm -hmm. or you're not able to counter what you're, you're seeing in front of you something just isn't quite there and yeah eventually over time it'll click and you, you know you might find it but you might have lost confidence in your ability to throw the shot or you might not actually practice it in the ring so what we often see is with you know within sparring students will do stuff on the pads and that they'll never ever take into a live match against an opponent mm. so really what we're going to talk about today is what's missing from the drills and what can we add to that training in order to bridge that gap so um Definitely. The, the, the golden so what question. Are missing? Exactly, exactly. And, and you know, go ahead, go Richie. Ahead. I was just going to say that for me, the biggest thing that, that it's missing is um, two active sides. When we look at these clips here of live matches, both sides are actively trying to achieve an objective. And I think that that's the most important thing because our game is very, very much dynamic. Even if you take 10 seconds of the start of I don't know, 100 fights, they'll never be the same. It's such a dynamic and complex activity. And that's mm. very, very important. It's, it's a dance for two people. And that's very much dependent on what your opponent does as the options that are available to you. And we'll get into a, a little bit more of the whole idea of perception, what we kind of take in as information and the actions that we use. Um, but that's the gist of it at the minute of why often it doesn't work in terms of our traditional drills. Yeah, and I mean, as we watch both of those clips there, we've got, you know, a World Cup and we've got, uh, you know, a, a Russian National Championships as such or an invitational match. And, you know, in both scenarios, the first thing that you're going to notice is it's in a ring, right? And so we so rarely drill with the space relative to, you know, how we're actually going to see the space when we spar. So we're not in an eight by eight square where exits and things like that matter when we, when we drill typically. Mm we don't have the same pressures and we don't have the same resistance or opposition to what we're doing. So, you know, the, uh, the kind of challenges that you, that you face when you go into sparring just don't exist within the drill scenario, usually speaking. Um, and again, like you said, that element of two people. So the first thing you do when you step into the ring is I want to score those points. The other person doesn't want to let me. So they're going to disrupt yeah. me. They're going to mess it up on me. So it's not in their interest to let the drill work. So that's the first problem that we're going to run into. So how do we evolve and how do we work over that? So I think to get to there, we have to understand the next point, which is what goes on in a live sparring match that allows us to interpret what we see, choose a course of action and implement a successful, um, with a scoring option or defensive option, whatever it happens to be. Mm -hmm. So perception action, what is this? So basically the perception is the things that we take in in terms of information. Here, I'm not taking in any information in this. I'm just practicing a technique in isolation. So a good analogy for this is almost learning how to drive. So here we're learning how to use the pedals essentially, which are the, the end product, the techniques, learning how to turn the wheel. 
and um, but that's only like step one of the equation and w what really comes into play this these are the actions as such but yeah. the perception is the most vital piece when we take uh, the analogy of learning to drive for example it's the traffic lights and maybe a kid running in front that a chasing a ball that you got to stop very quickly and these are the decisions and the things that we have to act upon which make us essentially able to drive it's not just the pushing the pedals the changing of the gear these are the, the mechanical actions but it's the perception which allows everything to be different and essentially allows us to be able to drive effectively without any damage and it's the same thing for us in sparring the techniques themselves are the end product but it's the decisions and how we get there and and why they work is the important thing yeah and i think the more complex and flashy that the skill looks on the pad sometimes the more we think that there's thinking going on that there's uh that there is actually something being perceived and something acted upon and even with the very simple one that we were doing there with the back kick and you know uh there's a i think a feeling that oh well you don't you can't go until your opponent steps in it's like yeah. sure but then you have a simple cue we're at the correct distance to begin with there's a cue and there's a response it's you know it's it, it's not perceived you're not actually perceived you've already been told what to perceive so our mm -hmm. visual field isn't crowded we're not you know our, our, our attention our attentional focus uh isn't shifting it's narrow where we have a very simple cue to attend to and it's a it's an it's a binary thing it's an on off switch so the switch goes i go it it's not re you could say you're working on reaction times but you're not really because you've taken out all of the things that lead up to that reaction so yeah. in the end, these drills serve a particular purpose, and we'll come back to that later, but they are not preparing you for the introduction or for taking the technique and translating that into a sparring skill. Mm -hmm. And I think that's So the... essentially, you're in a, in a car park here just driving around the cone, and that's what it is. It's, it's very simple. It's a very isolated part of the whole game. Yeah. So, I mean, and, and to take one of the analogies you gave earlier, like if you're going to cross the street, you know, if you're a parent taking a child to the side of the street and you're teaching them to look left and right and put their foot on the zebra crossing and all the rest of it, that's all well and good. But they still have to learn how to perceive the distance between themselves and the approaching traffic on both sides. And you level that up when you're in a car at a junction and you've, you've just about got the hand, hang of the pedals and the balance of the clutch and the accelerator. And you have to judge, can you get onto that junction, onto that roundabout before the car you know meets you from the from the other side you know this mm -hmm. now is a different thing can you get that to work when you're sitting in the car park and the worst that happens is you look over at your dad and you're a bit embarrassed that you managed to you know conk out the car that that that's bad but you know you don't want to do the same thing in a you know crossing a busy road so there's mm -hmm. a point where you have to transition the skill uh, or transition it into a skill from a simple technique and so I think that almost goes some way to understanding why it's vital for ITF sparring. It's that element, isn't it, of the resistance and challenge. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, because our game is, is implicit in terms of the, the reactions that we make are very much internal. So it depends in the moment of the, basically what you perceive and then how you act upon that. And the important thing is it's called perception action coupling because they're coupled together. Yeah. You can't isolate one from the other. So you can't have an action without having to something to perceive upon, whether that's the distance between your opponent, the, the stance they may be in, etc. So when we do um, certain drills, then we got to include as much as that as possible. And of course, it's about progressively adding this resistance so you may start start off in isolation and that could be very simple as hitting a heavy bag that doesn't move sure but that's like the, the foundational lowest level possible and the, the trick is to build up that resistance eventually where whatever skill you're working on essentially looks like it's free sparring so the closer that it gets to looking like free sparring the more you're actually training the real skill definitely and i mean as we're watching some of these clips here we can see like yeah we're not representative that's a dial that you can tweak so as you said full sparring in a ring with a referee with uh with a score a scoreboard is as representative of sparring in a competition as we can get okay but we spend yeah. very very little time with the representativeness dial turned all the way up to 11 there and your opponent is the same size same weight you know all those kind of things more normally we're working with having to tweak that up and down a little bit and see okay uh, this isn't really like real sparring, but it allows us to focus on a particular element of the skill or technique that we're, we're working on. Or it allows us, as in some of those skills there, 
to uh, to work on a physical component, maybe working on our explosive repeats. Yeah. We're looking on, you know, we're, we're basically doing interval training. Maybe we're looking at something like the last drill there from Master Barada's gym, where we're looking at uh, translating pure just leg strength development, yeah. you know, into something that's a little bit more representative of how that leg strength would be utilized in the sparring ring. Um, you know, and, and there's a whole gradient in between, like from that, you know, that red to the green on a on a, a temperature dial kind of thing where you're looking at it. It's like, OK, I can make it more representative when I need to, less representative when I need to. But it is important mm -hmm. and imperative to understand that if you never move the dial towards representative and it never looks like and feels like a spar, it won't translate. There's too big a barrier um, because you're not, you're simply not, as we were saying before, you're not perceiving the right things. You're not linking what you're seeing to the appropriate actions through trial and error and experience trial when you don't error. do that. So important. Yeah, yeah definitely. definitely. And I, I think that the biggest thing here is that usually we live in one area or the other. We're either at full 10 out of 10 representatives representativeness in terms of free sparring yeah. or we're at like one or two where it's like very isolation based drill training. And we don't kind of bridge that gap between. And I think that that's where people miss out is that the things that you're working in your training to develop your skills, you just then go into free sparring and you don't get the opportunity to almost work on those because it's so different. And um, so what this essentially is, is speeding up the process by allowing you to work on a skill and get closer and closer and closer, bringing it into that full representativeness of free sparring. Yeah, definitely. So I suppose it would only be fair then to have a look at some examples of how we might start to grade that up and see how it looks. Mm -hmm. And I, I think one of the things to prepare people for is whenever you, the reason you don't see this sometimes, you know, on Instagram is because it's messy. You know, it um, yeah. it doesn't work all the time. Whereas when you're drilling on a pad, you can make it look sweet. You can make it fast, explosive, the whole lot. Mm, sometimes ju just getting there and bridging the gap with a skill is a little less pretty. So... We're, we're and just... based on that actually as well some people might not know this but pad work and all of this stuff actually originated in the 1930s in boxing where marketing and newspaper articles were actually a thing of promoting the fight sure. um, so they, they used to do all these fancy techniques and stuff like that to prepare and you still see it today on the 24 7s and the embedded mm -hmm. and things like that and then we see it on instagram and it looks great and then everybody thinks that's the way to do it and um, but we can see here in some of these clips of how the resistance is coming away from being very isolation based practice into a bit more representative with two sides being a bit more active yeah so and i mean certainly the resistance in that last exercise is quite low and then you know you can pick it up as you go mm. so this one here is is working on a back kick where um, the black belt here is trying to close the distance she has an objective of her own she's trying to make contact with the shield without um, the person who's using the back kick being able to land the back kick so they both have an objective so there's distance being adjusted and you can see the decisions that have to be made by both of them and this is mm. still not at the full level of resistance it's just bridging that gap like we spoke about earlier exactly and we've introduced in this particular one this is a you know an early stage development of trying to link back kick and hands or hands to back kick and uh, a lot of the other elements of the spar have been left in and the hogu has been or the body armor has been left in there to uh, encourage people to take the chances because obviously those are shots in particular the back kick is one where you know if, if you're throwing an awful lot of them and you're you're interacting with the hands with it a lot you can have some very sore ribs by the end of a session mm. but we can see that you know as people are then experimenting with what things link what other shots can i introduce in order to let me link the hands to the back kick back kick is an escape as an entry um can i take a, a messy broken play situation and squeeze in you know the shots there like, as you have with this here it's like maybe it fits in and sometimes the initial part of it is just it's it's making the shapes and figuring out how it's going to work. And as we, you know, in the first day, so maybe that's the first day we're doing that exercise that way and we're recording it. It looks like how oh, can any of these guys even throw a back kick is that, you know, it, and I can assure you they can. But the the, the feel is it, it looks like they can't do either the, the, the hands or the back kick particularly well. And all we've done is ask them, yeah, but just put them together because maybe that's not what they've done. So maybe they're used to throwing the back mm. kick, you know, just as a direct counter and escape, or they're used to having the hands and following a returning kick. But when you try to force or encourage something different, 
the brain kind of goes into that, you know, that, that, that threat state of like, oh, I don't know how to do this. This isn't natural. This isn't normal. They're not perceiving the opportunities the way you think they should. And of course they're not. They haven't practiced in that particular way. And so that's and, exactly and what that's we're saying. Point. It's messy. That's exactly, it. Exactly, yeah. Because if you did this, like you said, these guys are well able to throw um, a back kick in hands, for example. Sure. So if somebody was holding the gloves for them or the pads for them to practice this, it would look beautiful and it would be really precise and really accurate. But that's the point. That's not what we're practicing for. So that's why I love the fact that um, your guys there are wearing the hogus because it is meant to be messy. There is meant to be successes and failures for this to yeah. work. And that's the whole point. It's We learn through trial and error. We, when we learn as humans, we learn much quicker through trial and error. Uh, think about when you learn to walk. That's mm. how you learn much quicker. It's not where you stay, okay, it, this is the technique, and you practice the technique over and over again. You get up, you fall down. It's like, okay, I've extended my balance too far. And that's what you. That's how you learn as a human, and you do it much quicker as well. So trial and error is the key to this. And that's why I like the fact that you guys have the, the hogu in that clip there because there's meant to be successes and failures. It's meant to be messy. Yeah, and it's just our duty as a coach then to try to make sure that the failures aren't catastrophic. But like, yeah. you know, it's the Samuel Beckett one of like ever tried, ever failed, fail again, fail better. You know, it, it's that kind of idea mm -hmm. of what we're trying to do is improve the quality of the failed efforts to where actually what we've got is learning. And, you know, yeah. because every failed effort is also information to you know, to process, okay, well, that didn't work. Why didn't that work? What can be improved the next time when we iterate, we try that again, that didn't work. Okay, what do we, you know, what did we learn from that failure until you go? But you have to be willing to fail and fail repeatedly uh, in order to, to mm -hmm. learn. Otherwise, your students will kind of latch onto whatever their first successful, like, um, prototype was you know oh well yeah. go, be, going strong with my hands seemed to work that first tournament and so I, I, I'm confident so I try with my hands I go stronger I go stronger and all of a sudden someone develops better distance or a back kick or a stop side mm -hmm. kick or something and now it's not working anymore well I'm afraid to try anything else and now yeah. what I know doesn't work where am I so you don't want to develop that reliance early on on something like that and why this, uh, like for people that don't know, this is um, the constraint-led approach. So mm -hmm. we are essentially, as coaches, facilitating um, the opportunities for learning. So we're presenting a situation, a problem, um, something that you got to objectively achieve by constraining the rules of free sparring. So yeah. essentially the rules were constrained here in this example that you can only use back kick and hands, for example, to facilitate that to happen more. Um, but the whole beauty of this is that it allows um, the individual athletes or students to kind of express themselves a little bit more and um, where it's not like you're you're in a conveyor belt with a cookie cutter approach trying to create the same athlete over and over again because our body types are different our experiences are different so the things that you can work are much more free flowing you have more sure. options there's no one way to skin a cat, as they say. So, you know, there's there's many ways to solve a problem. And that's one of the beauties of it is that everybody here can be um, learning through this approach and they can essentially be fruitful in this approach as well, which is which is very, very important if you're looking to keep your athletes involved longer, making them enjoy their training and things like that. So maybe let's just summarize this for everybody before we uh, finish with today's episode. So, um and the first thing was the difference between our basic drills and something that has more of a perception action component to it is going to be how representative it is. And we see two contrasting drills here, how representative it is to what you would experience in a real match. Um, mm -hmm. I put this clip in just because the camera is in there as well. It's just remember when you're looking at stuff on Instagram or YouTube, like, you know, it's probably been done for the camera or picked out of a match because it looks good. Just keep that in the back yeah. of your mind. <laughs> yeah and that like that second clip that we seen here where i was doing the, the side kick back mm. kick there's a reason why that's our most viewed video on youtube on this channel it has over a quarter of a million views just because it's aesthetic to the eye and um, but like that's not a way of you training i'm not going to get better at landing that shot in sparring through that drill it's simply just to get my students happy and free flowing with their yeah. shots and just just enjoy the kicks that's part of it as well context is key well, that's it. And I mean, I, you, you've said it exactly there. And that's why I included one or two of them. So some of the explosive repeat elements that we included in that last summary clip, they look good. They're explosive. They last for a short duration of time. And they go onto Instagram or YouTube and they get, the, you know, the hits and it, it's wonderful stuff. But the reality is that those have been included for metabolic conditioning in a way that yep. is as 
it's as representative of the challenge that we find in our taekwondo sparring as we can make it for fitness training but Mm -hmm. not for sparring skill acquisition so it's important maybe that just as a finishing point on the summary to have that hat on what are we trying to do so if our goal is to develop agility balance coordination rhythm you know or one of the metabolic pathways well sure a lot of those drills might have a very very nice function if your goal is to create or to translate a skill into something that you can use in the sparring ring then we got to dial up that representativeness we have to introduce that perception action coupling that decision making and then we should start to see that transfer absolutely that's that's it it's about skills here is the whole purpose of this chat today yeah. It's not about the, the other things like the, the leg strength we've seen with Master Barada or maybe the, the rhythm drills that we've seen. you got to take it with, a, with the context that, that the coach has in mind. But what the message we're trying to get across to people today is if you're trying to improve your sparring skills to bring to the ring, it's not just about the techniques. It's more about the bigger picture of why those techniques work. And that all comes back to the perception. So the more perception and the more added progressive resistance we can have in our training, the better results you will get from your sparring training and that's us so richie if you bring us out of here yeah absolutely i hope you enjoy this one guys it's uh something that we're very very passionate about and we could probably go over an hour on this topic adrian i'm sure um, and sure? so if you're interested in it let us know we can put some more posts etc and um, if you did enjoy this one hit us a like on youtube hit the thumbs up button if you're new to the channel and you're interested in more taekwondo content like this make sure and subscribe and we'll catch you in the next one